affliction. It's entirely, and again, I say this respectfully, but it is an entirely unbiblical Trinitarian invention in order to force a doctrine into a text that never states the same. Let me give you a few grammatical facts from the Old Testament uh, that says that we're not, shows that we're not assuming that Yahweh is one individual, but that the text indeed forces us to believe that God exists as one individual. And indeed, oneness Pentecostals feel that we are held hostage by the very scriptures to deny the doctrine of the Trinity. The, Yah the Tetragrammaton Yahweh is mentioned approximately 7,000 times in the Old Testament. Virtually always, almost every time, it is mentioned with singular personal pronouns. The term God, Lord God, and Yahweh is mentioned over 12,000 times, and not one time will you find three divine individuals mentioned in the text. Approximately 9,000 times, God applies singular personal pronouns to himself. Trinitarianism would have us to impose three separate divine individuals back upon 9,000 singular personal pronouns, which is just a grossly unnatural interpretation and reading of a singular personal pronoun. 810,677 words, ladies and gentlemen, 31,103 verses, 9,000 singular personal pronouns by God's covenant people, and not one single time did they ever acknowledge a multi-individual deity in 4,000 years of Hebrew history. This is the scriptural environment from which the New Testament writers sprang and alluded back to. The New Testament writers' writings were Koine Greek indeed, but their paradigm was Old Testament Hebraic Hebrewism, which they were not seeking to radically alter. I submit tonight that 90 years of New Testament history does not radically alter 4,000 years of Hebrew revelation of God's very identity. Our position tonight is that the one Old Testament God that we read about loved humanity enough that he came down and manifest himself in the flesh in order to save us. This one Old Testament Yahweh assumed a human mind at the incarnation distinct from his divinity. Thus, there was a simultaneous conscious awareness of himself both as God and man without mixture. This explains why we see never any father and son distinctions in the Old Testament. Ask yourselves tonight, why is it that we never see, read, even read of the Father and the Son under the Old Testament? This would be very strange behavior for two eternal individuals with absolutely no dialogue from a second eternal divine individual. If there were no co-eternal divine persons in the Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen, what would we expect? Nothing. What do we find, ladies and gentlemen? Nothing. Nothing. Not until the New Testament that you read such interaction when God actually fathered a son in Luke chapter 1. This is precisely the reason that Jesus is called the Son of God. In the sense that God fathered a son at Bethlehem. And this is indeed the most natural understanding of the phrase Son of. Who Jesus is never identified as in the scriptures is God the Son or an eternal son or a second of three divine individuals. Jesus is the God-man. At times he spoke and acted from his genuine humanity. If, for example, when he slept and when he grew weary. Yet Psalm 121 tells us that God, as God, neither slumbers nor sleeps. Yet Jesus slept in the bottom of the boat. Isaiah 40 says that God neither faints nor grows weary. Yet Jesus grew weary on the well, Jacob's well. Yet Jesus did both of all of these things according to his humanity. At other times, Jesus spoke and acted from his deity. When he forgave sins... Whenever he walked on the water, as God, we would submit that he was transcendent, operating beyond the incarnation. As the son of God, he functioned within the self-imposed limitations of the incarnation in the sense that that self-same God that we've been reading about the whole time under the Old Testament is the one who came in the New Testament. So that in the final analysis, we have a full God and a full man without mixture. Now, we're probably going to hear tonight that oneness Pentecostals have a schizophrenic bipersonal Jesus, and it is a total straw man. I don't know of a oneness Pentecostal alive who says that. I, I don't know of one, and I know many. Um, but I'm prepared to deal with it, and we will see tonight, before the night's over, that it's actually my honorable opponent who is guilty of splitting Jesus. But I'll just wait till that, till that comes up. The natural implication of the Trinitarian position necessitates, necessitates that the first 
and the third divine co-eternal individual with his, their own minds loved us enough that they ordered the second divine co-eternal individual with his own mind to endure the horrors of Calvary, to be beat, to be spit upon, to be whipped and to be crucified. As Jesus himself said in John 7 and 28 and 8 and 42, I did not come of my own initiative, but he sent me. W.E. Vines and Joseph Thayer, I realize Thayer is a bit dated, uh, but you don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's still some interesting things that he says. And also my opponent appeals to Joseph Thayer as well in his books right over here that I've got. But, but Joseph Thayer said that the Greek verb sent when he says, I did not come of my own initiative, but he sent me, is the Greek verb apostello, and it defines as to order one to go to another place. So the first and the third divine individual ordered the second divine individual to be beat, to be marred, and to be hung upon a tree. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Trinitarian natural ramification of the belief. It's not a straw man, and I would ask my opponent tonight to adequately deal with John 8 and 42 from the Trinitarian perspective. Yet the oneness position is that the one we've been reading about the whole time under the Old Testament is the same one that arrives on the scene in the New Testament. The same familiar God we've been reading about in the Old Testament is the same one who came to die as a man. Ephesians 2 and 20 tells us that the New Testament church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Of course, a reference to the Old Testament prophets upon whom the New Testament writers built. This tells us that the, teaches us rather, that the Old Testament Jewish prophets and the New Testament Jewish apostles had the same foundation. No one is going to pick up their Bible and read from Genesis to Malachi and read the 9,000 singular personal pronouns applied to God, which Mr. White tells us in the New Testament infers one person. So when we Try that out in the Old Testament, and one singular personal pronoun is applied to God 9,000 times. No one's going to read from Genesis to Malachi. Then turn the page to Matthew and read where it says he is God with us and naturally arrive that Jesus is the second divine individual in the Trinity. It is an entirely unnatural and forced interpolation. The Old Testament Jewish prophets did not understand God to be one individual uh, didn't understand God to be one individual with 9,000 singular personal pronouns. Then the New Testament Jewish apostles come along and add two divine individuals to God. They had the same foundation, not different foundations. Uh, John chapter 4 and verse 22, Jesus says that the Jews know what they worship. Now, Mr. White has derided me on his show, The Dividing Line, um, over and over on my usage, many things, by the way, but, but on my usage of Gnosko versus Oida. But I'll just let him argue with Dr. W.E. Vine here tonight. Dr. Vine says this, the differences between Gnosko and Oida, well, let me explain first. There, there's two words. Jesus says the Jews know what they worship. Now, there's two Greek words for no, primarily, there, there's other, but primarily two Greek words, and that is gnosko and oida. W. E. Vine says this. He says the differences between gnosko and oida demand consideration. Gnosko frequently suggests progress in knowledge, while oida suggests fullness in knowledge. Now, again, Mr. White can argue with W. E. Vine. I didn't write that. That didn't come out of my mouth. That come, I read that in his book. Um, so Jesus carefully uses the stronger term oida in John chapter 4 when he says the Jews know what they worship. How could the Jews know what they worship when the Jews have never worshipped uh, three individuals in a trinity? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. Uh